Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Live at Four on this Wednesday. It feels like fall it today, does. doesn't it? Opened up the windows this morning. I know, pretty. it's so nice. Taste of things to come, but it's not going to last long. No. We'll get all the weather details in just a minute, but first, here's what's making news today. It was a long day and night for some travelers aboard an Amtrak train that got stalled in Portage. Keely Arthur talked to some of the stranded passengers. Final farewells to Senator John McCain begin today at the Arizona Capitol. And say goodbye to quarterback number two, sports director Jay Wilson will be here with today's developments in Packerland. And there are quite a few. Yes, there are. Let's take a look outside today. It was brisk and cool. Good day to walk the dogs and yeah. air out a little yeah, bit. Absolutely. That humidity gone and no rain. Feeling like fall, though. And Dana Fulton's in the backyard. Don't get used to it. <laughs> oh, I wish I could. I gotta admit, the last breeze that came through, I got some goosebumps, actually. <laughs> it's a little cool outside right now, guys. Uh, it does feel lovely. It's not going to last at all. A little taste before we move into September. Uh, right now, we have a mostly clear sky throughout uh, most of the Midwest, actually. Really a pleasant Wednesday afternoon, an opportunity to dry up just a little bit for us. Uh, right now, we do have just a few clouds in the sky, but overall, mostly sunny currently, and we've been mostly sunny for most of the day. Really a nice Wednesday uh, throughout southern Wisconsin. We're currently sitting close to about 69 degrees, so that's about 10 degrees below average from where we should be. And compared to this time yesterday, it's a big drop in our temperatures. Everywhere southeast of here has had that cooler air move in behind that cold front, so we cooled down today. Again, not going to last for too long. As we look ahead to tomorrow, actually, already starting to see just a little bit of a warm up. We get closer to the low 70s for our highs tomorrow, but no rain in the forecast for our Thursday. That's the good news there. We'll switch over and take a look at your first alert traffic right now. Overall things outside uh, seem to be cruising along fairly smoothly for our Wednesday and downtown. I do want to take a closer look there in just a second after we get our, our belt line speeds. I'm going in the low 20s right now, so a crawl, but uh, movement for us. All those markers that you see on the downtown strip, those are road closures because of a flooding water still on the roadways. And we still have that closure for 14 heading out of Middleton. So keep that in mind if you're hitting the road right now. We'll keep a close eye on traffic. I'll have another update on that as well as your forecast in just a few minutes. All right, we will see you then. Sounds good. Put on a little wrap or something with your children. <laughs> yes, I know. She's from South Carolina, so it's... <laughs> so right. savor it. I love it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dana. First at four, Governor Scott Walker declared a state of emergency for the entire state of Wisconsin. This after a week of severe storms, flooded neighborhoods, and tornadoes. While conditions in the Madison area are subsiding, a little bit. There are still many areas still flooded from the rains of the past few days. And Amy Reed is in Sauk County where conditions are still serious. Amy. Yeah, we're in front of the Baraboo River in Reedsburg. It's about 21 feet right now. The and you'll remember that the emergency management said it's going to come up at about 22 and a half feet. So the mayor hopes that that's going to happen at about six or seven tonight. Water's rising here at about three inches an hour. It's been that way for the last five or so hours. And before that, it was six inches an hour. And you can see the water is coming close to level with the bridge. The city's goal is to not have to close this main road. They said the road is shaped like a turtle shell. So even if water does come over into the road, they should be able to keep those middle lanes open because it's a little rounded. Now over that hill back there on Highway 33, the people here said that the water is filling the road. They said there were some people that had to evacuate homes there. They're likely taking shelter at the Red Cross shelter at the high school here in Reedsburg. Now down the road, down Highway 33 in Laval, you might remember we were there last night and the main road was flooded with what looks like feet of water. Now the Reedsburg mayor said that Laval already saw that water from the Hillsboro Dam and it has crested there. You remember the water from the Hillsboro Dam was coming up over and that was that's what was threatening Reedsburg and Laval. But it's crested in Laval and it's come down about four inches and the mayor here in Reedsburg hopes that that's what they see here tonight. Now. We are going to keep an eye on things here in Reedsburg, but for now, we'll go ahead and send it back to you. Right, let's hope for the best in Reedsburg. Amy Move, Reed that Reed water's Reed. moving Yeah, fast. it is moving downstream. Yeah, hurry. Thanks, Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Madison Mayor Paul Soglin says last night's storm did not produce excessive rain, so there were no evacuations in the Isthmus area. That's good news. He says, however, the city is still dealing with high lake levels as Lake Monona is at record level and Mendota is only down one inch from 
from the record level. In what has become a daily news briefing, the mayor said he hopes there will be minimal rainfall in the coming days and both lakes should be down by Sunday or Monday. Trips are back on track after two commuter trains were stranded because of flooding. Keely Arthur shares how crews worked for about 20 hours to clear water from the railways. That's right, we spoke with some of those passengers while they were waiting, most headed to Portland, Oregon, but instead were stuck in Portage, Wisconsin. As we reported, two trains were stuck after rain flooded parts of the railway. One in Toma headed back from Seattle, and this train you see here stuck in Portage. Both stranded yesterday evening, but moving by 12.05 p.m. today. Passengers did receive free meals and drinks, which helped keep them calm in a pretty uncomfortable situation. This morning now they've been giving us coffee and they're going to feed us at lunch. So, And it's not Amtrak's fault, you know, the, it's Mother Nature at her best, you know. Those trains are now scheduled to arrive at their destinations about a day later than planned. Amtrak put out a statement saying they appreciated the patience of their customers and the work by Canadian Pacific to restore the route. Just to keep everybody safe. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. I was very impressed by the way everyone was handling themselves. Yeah. If I was stuck on a train for 18 hours, I wouldn't be well, well, It's like a 27, 28 hour trip anyway, so you know you're going to be on the train but, right. for a long time. <laughs> That's a good point, yeah. But, but yeah, that, very calm, cool, and collected. Not that long. That's good way. to hear. It's a certain person that rides the train, I think. <laughs> Keely, thank you. Thanks, Keely. The man who died after driving his car into the water off the Merrimack Ferry landing had a heart transplant last year and was an advocate for blood donors. 57 year old Scott Kirkpatrick of Middleton died last night when he drove his car into the Wisconsin River. A passenger in the car escaped and said they thought it was a normal road. Deputies say it's unclear if the situation was flooding related. Kirkpatrick had a heart transplant last year after suffering a heart attack while driving and crashing into a tree. He and his wife Carrie were on News 3 this morning just this past June, encouraging people to become blood donors. He needed numerous transfusions during the surgery and his recovery. The first four days of public events celebrating the life of the late Senator John McCain are underway in Arizona. The six-term senator is lying in state in the rotunda of the Arizona State Capitol. Chris Martinez reports from Phoenix. People stood on the side of the road to salute the hearse carrying Senator John McCain's flag-draped casket to the Arizona Capitol. McCain's wife Cindy and seven children attended a short service where the senator was remembered as one of Arizona's favorite adopted sons. Imagining Arizona without John McCain is like picturing an Arizona without the Grand Canyon. It's just not natural. Former Senator John Kyle remembered McCain for his political instincts. When others were looking into Vladimir Putin's eyes with an eye of understanding him and reaching accommodation with him, John, of course, said, I looked into his eyes and I saw KGB. Outside, Arizonans lined up in 105 degree heat to pay their final respects to the six term senator. He's done a lot for the country, uh, he's a great statesman. Officials at the state capitol say they will keep the building open to the public until everyone moves through the line. Larry Osborne and his wife are Navy veterans. We admired him, we uh, respected him, and just like he was a great hero and a great person. And Virginia Olia is a makeup artist who got to know the senator through his many TV appearances. Television news, 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock, whatever in the morning. He would come in and he always had a smile on his face. Today would have been McCain's 82nd birthday. His daughter Megan was overcome with emotion as she placed her hand on the casket. Chris Martinez, CBS News, Phoenix, Arizona. Another viewing will be held at the U.S. Capitol on Friday. A memorial service is set for Saturday at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. And another big departure from the Trump administration has been announced. The president confirmed his administration's top lawyer would depart soon, tweeting White House counsel Don McCann will be leaving his position in the fall shortly after the confirmation, hopefully, of Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the United States Supreme Court. I've worked with Don for a long time and truly appreciate his service. McCann tells CBS News that he was surprised by the tweet. So as Senate Judiciary Committee Chair Chuck Grassley, who tweeted back, I hope it's not true, you can't let that happen. 
When this day began, the Green Bay Packers had four quarterbacks. This afternoon, they're down to three. Who's gone and who just signed a big contract? Sports director Jay Wilson is here with some clarification. Hello. We knew it was good to be Aaron Rodgers. But that's going to extend his contract four years for $134 million. He's getting a $57.5 million signing bonus. $100 million of that is guaranteed. And the average per year salary is going to be $33.5 million per year. I need his agent. Yeah, there's, there's I mean, he can do cool stuff like that with a football. And we just saw number seven. Yes, that's another story. One more thing about okay. Rodgers. Uh, $33.5 million a year. Do you know how much Beyonce made last year? I don't know. 107 million. <laughs> well, how does it compare within the NFL? Well, he he's now become the the highest paid NFL player. Uh, Matt Ryan of the Atlanta Falcons, their quarterback, signed a deal that was averaging 30 million dollars a year. Rodgers is going to get 33 and a half million dollars a year. So, you know, I mean, it, he's it's, Beyonce it's, to us. He is. <laughs> yeah, even if you could just sing, you carry a tune, well, yeah. well then you can well, get an extra 50 million. And, and, and some will say, boy, that's a lot of money. But you know, at the same time, look what happened when he wasn't there last year. Mm -hmm. And that, that leads us to number seven, who no longer is a part of the Packers, as uh, Brett Hundley, their backup quarterback last year, who came in to play nine games when Rodgers was injured with a broken collarbone. Hundley traded to Seattle for a sixth-round draft pick today. He was the Packers' fifth-round draft pick in 2015. And in the preseason, he looked good at times. Like, mm -hmm. Remember that last year? But yeah. then when he came in last year, it just... Just what was his work. record when he was filling in for? He was Rogers? three and six. Yeah, you know, and, and that's not all on so, him. So who they, who they bring in? So uh, uh, Deshaun Kaiser was traded from the Cleveland Browns to the Packers. Now Deshaun Kaiser struggled with a one and fifteen Cleveland Browns team last year, but if you're going to trade for a guy, that usually is a sign you're going to keep that guy. And uh, Tim Boyle is a free agent from Eastern Kentucky, who's shown some good things in the preseason as well. So, you know, part of it could be financial, but Part of it is Brett Hundley basically wore out his welcome and he was deemed that he wasn't the guy and I think last year showed that. So he'll go to Seattle, back up Russell Wilson. Deshaun Kaiser will be the guy a heartbeat away, whatever, <laughs> God forbid anything would happen to Aaron Rodgers and then Tim Boyle would be the backup. And it sounds like they're going to keep all three guys on the 53-man roster, which doesn't always happen. A lot of times they'll keep two and then put a third guy on the practice squad. But it sounds like they're going to have three of the 53 taken up by quarterbacks. But the best hope is they'll never play. Number 12, <laughs> number 12, number 12. Stay healthy. You got it. For, and for that kind of money, mm -hmm. you better. It's Mark Kane money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll take Beyonce money. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Well, there's more to come before. They're calling it the scallop wars. We'll find out why fishermen are coming to blows in the English Channel when Live at Four continues.
The battle over prized shellfish comes to blows in the English Channel. French and British fishermen rammed their boats in an angry dispute that people are calling the Scallop Wars. A French TV crew captured the clash on the high seas. French fishermen fighting with their British rivals in waters off the Normandy coast. Oh, they're throwing things. Some throwing smoke bombs, <laughs> stones, and insults, and it's all over a skirmish over scallops. Essentially, we're fishing 40 miles off the French coast uh, when a flotilla of French fishermen came out, surrounded the vessel, along with mine and, and, and other UK vessels. This looks like it could be very it's dangerous. Great video, though. French law says the fishermen can only catch scallops in the area between October and May, but Brits are able to fish all year round. In previous years, both sides were able to reach an agreement to share the stock of shellfish, but this year that didn't happen, and the British fishermen are demanding government protection. All right, stocks rallied on Wall Street, led by trade optimism and tech stocks. The Dow Industrials added 60 points, ending the day at 26,124. The Nasdaq Composite Index up 79 points, closing at a record high. The Nasdaq Composite Index tacked on 16 and a half for a fourth record close in a row. Well, do you feel externally stressed, eternally, eternally. St <laughs> eternally stressed, that is, by life's demands? Then on top of it, there's national politics and devastating local flooding. Yeah, news has been very difficult, mm -hmm. it's been very heavy, very negative, and sometimes it feels like the world is on fire, doesn't it? And it can be more than we can handle. So what do we do? UW clinical professor Christine Whalen is back with us to save the day. No sure. pressure, Christine. No pressure. No scallop wars here. <laughs> no. No, but we hear it all the time that people uh, are getting exhausted by so much negative news. Yeah. That per perception is sort of becoming reality, isn't it? It's true, and you know, my research shows that as the world seems to be ending around us, what people kind of tend to do is pull inward. So interestingly enough, as opinion surveys show that we're losing trust in government officials and we're very anxious about other things around us, we tend to buy more self-help books. Oh, that's interesting. And that's a positive thing, isn't it? It could think? be a positive thing, right? That, that we are, that we're, but it means that we're trying to fix ourselves rather than fixing the world, right? Because we say it's just impossible to fix the world. So we turn inward. But the other bit of, of research on happiness shows that there is actually a better way. And what's that? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I'm, glad that, you asked. That, I'm glad you asked. That's See, this, what, is this is the good news. This is the good news. Yeah. This is the good news. So what we really need is to um, to approach all these issues with a human ecological perspective, and that's a phrase that I don't think most people aren't particularly familiar with. But I teach in the School of Human Ecology here at UW Madison, and what we study is how individuals are interconnected, interconnected to each other and to the world around us. And what research shows is that our happiness, our individual happiness increases when we take positive social action to help others as well. So rather than just turning inward, taking this ecological interdependent approach actually makes us happier. So for example, you're watching the flooding and you're feeling yes. depressed and overwhelmed by it, but if you actually get out and help somebody fill sandbags, then it makes it more manageable. Is that sort of what you mean? Right, so you think about what you are most passionate about, where you can use your resources of time and money, and get involved. Now, that's not to say that you don't want to pay attention to yourself and your own personal improvement, absolutely. But real happiness and thriving is a mix of both. Mm. Does it help or does it do any good just to turn it all off? I have tried that. <laughs> I have tried when your that. basement's flooding, I guess, then you got to come to reality. Exactly. You know, and, and I think in the, sh in the short term, you, everyone needs to give themselves a break. But I teach a class here at UW-Madison about belonging, purpose, and the ecology of human happiness. And I'm really teaching these first-year students how to get involved, how to see themselves as part of a larger whole. Because when we approach life not through an ego approach, where we're thinking me, me, me all the time, but an eco approach, where we're thinking of the me and the we together, that actually makes us as individuals happier. So turning it all off and tuning out, maybe in the short term, but in the long term, getting involved about the things that you care about to make a difference. So if politics, if politics are on your mind, get out and campaign or Absolutely. volunteer your time to a, to a political party of your choice. That's right, we have midterms coming up. I mean, get involved and, uh, and, and try to make a difference about what matters to you. That sense of individual empowerment actually boosts self-efficacy and makes you as an individual happier.
I like that because, I mean, even if you look at it in the construct of the flooding, there's always a silver lining. When yes. the news just gets to be so difficult and depressing, there's always something positive that Communities comes out Communities come of it. together, people help each other. Right. I live right. in Shorewood Hills. It's been very hard hit. We have all come together. The volunteers have been amazing. They've been putting in so many t hours and, uh, and, and lots of energy to help people in need. I know the whole community has come together around that, and it's been really amazing to yeah. see. So that yeah. helps you inside. It does. It helps us as individuals, and it helps the community. That's human ecology in action. So here now you've learned a new term, human ecology, <laughs> right? How we interact with our natural built and social environments to all become happier people. I love the eco versus the ego. Yes. That's a good thing to think about. So the about. class is yeah. called Eco You. <laughs> oh, and it's good. about an ecological approach to your individual well-being. So if you think the world's on fire, grab a bucket. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, get involved. Emily, thank you. Thank good you. advice as usual. Great to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. And we'll be right back with a visit to the Tomatina Festival. Festival. Take a look at this. Please pass the tomatoes. More than 20,000 people took part in one of Europe's most exuberant food fights in the annual Tomatina Festival in Banul, that's in west-eastern Spain. The town was turned into a red zone for an hour as people from all over the world pelted each other with ripe tomatoes, leaving the streets flowing with pulp. Ugh. 160 tons of tomatoes were trucked in. The festival was inspired by a food fight between local children in 1945. <laughs> I All right. Drove through that town when we were in Spain oh, a couple really? years ago. Yeah, it's right by Valencia down there. Did you have to dodge tomatoes at all? It wasn't, was the, it? No, it wasn't, it wasn't the season. Different time. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Wednesday, August 29th, it is Willing to Lend a Hand at Wednesday. Oh, see, that's good news. Positive. Yeah. yeah. Here you come. It's also More Herbs, Less Salt Day. 
Get some flavor in there That's instead good. of just instead dumping of salt. salt all over. That's and it is National Swiss Winemakers Day. Now, when you think of Switzerland, you obviously don't think of wine mm -hmm. immediately, but the country has produced wine since the Roman Empire. Makes sense. Rocky soil, cooler yeah. environment. Do you remember wine when you were no, there? No, I remember chocolate and watches. <laughs> she lived there. Yeah, she I lived there for oh, a while. Oh, did you yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, but not ah. wine. See, I'm learning something. You're too young. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was too young for <laughs> okay. the wine, but not the chocolate. But the chocolate was important. That's yeah. fair. Refreshing day today. Beautiful day, as we talked about earlier. Feeling like fall outside. It's really nice currently. Uh, we are in for a little warming trend, though. And, of course, our next round of rain always right around the corner. We'll take a closer look at your forecast right after the break. Definitely a lovely Wednesday. If you had a little bit of a midweek slump, I think the weather could have helped cheer you up a little bit outside. It feels wonderful currently. A few clouds early this morning, but now we're seeing a clearing sky. Mostly sunny right now, just a few clouds out there and certainly no rain. That's great news for the rest of the day. If that's the message that you can walk away with right now, plan on a nice dry evening overnight as well for us on this Wednesday. Looking pretty good outside for us in Madison. I want to back up just a little bit, though. This is a look at the last 48 hours. So picking up all of that rainfall that we saw yesterday, a nice band through central Wisconsin, uh, anywhere from six to eight inches. Some areas picking up just a little more than that, uh, just dumping water there. And then everywhere south, closer to that one to two inch range. Again, a few isolated areas picking up a little bit more. This is all on top of, as we said, rainfall that we just don't need right now. So there is still a flood warning in effect until about 1045 this evening. Do you know and Adams County included in that because of the rainfall that we saw yesterday. Uh, no rain today, no rain tonight, but the water levels for some rivers still rising and all of that rain is still draining down. So that flood warning again goes until this evening. Overall, our cold front that brought these showers is now southeast of Wisconsin and continuing to shift southeast, driving some showers towards the edge of Indiana and Ohio right now. We have some high pressure slowly shifting in keeping us clear today and for most of our 
Thursday. Chilly overnight tonight. If you have to open up the windows, I certainly recommend it. By this evening, we drop into the low 50s for early tomorrow morning. Tomorrow afternoon, we have a mix of clouds and sun again. We'll stay dry for your Thursday, and temps will be in the low 70s tomorrow. So a little warmer, but not quite at average just yet. I do you want to look ahead to Friday because uh, unfortunately have some bad news. A lot of green. That's rainfall for us as we look towards Friday afternoon and evening overnight into Saturday. That's when we're expecting some heavy rainfall to shift in. Still a little far out to break down the timing, but do know as we flash ahead to Friday and Saturday, uh, rainfall comes right back into the forecast for us lingering into early Saturday. Right now, enjoy the weather, guys. Get outside if you can this evening. A few clouds, but otherwise really pleasant for us. High today, 69. Again, that's pretty below average for us. We should be a little closer to the upper 70s and nowhere near the record. We'll leave the 90s somewhere in the past uh, 69 currently. So we're sitting right at our high for the day. Humidity feels pretty good outside dew points at about 53 overnight. Again, cool down quite a bit. There is a little bit of a chance for some fog to develop early tomorrow morning. Just a slight chance for us and by tomorrow afternoon, mostly sunny and quite pleasant outside. I have about 73 for us tomorrow for our, our, our Thursday. We're really going to be able to enjoy that weather for Thursday. Our warming trend picks up though as we head towards Thursday evening into Friday. Again, 73 are high for Thursday. Friday, we get a little closer to average, about 78 for us, but that chance for rain is going to move back in late Friday and hang out with us into Saturday morning. Saturday, we stay warm into the 80s for the weekend. A slight chance for storms is going to linger into Sunday, but it's a pretty minimal chance for us on Sunday, and we are going to have some storms marching into next week as well. Humidity bumps back up too. Be a little muggy for the start of next week, and then we cool down for the end of next week. So, temps warming up, then going back down a little roller coaster there. Uh, the rainfall, though, kind of sticking with us once we get past Labor Day, unfortunately. I know Friday night, of course, the first UW game. Um, I hate to to be watching the rain for Friday. Wish we weren't watching the rain for Friday, but we do have the chance for those showers again marching into the forecast for late Friday. And that's a night game. It Friday is a night, night. game, yeah. unfortunately. So uh, what we're hoping for there, of course, uh, keep an eye on the timing. And if it is going to be rain, um, some lighter rainfall would be the ideal situation for Friday. Yeah, still a lot of water to flow downstream. Absolutely. Still water flowing for us. Still a few rivers we're keeping an eye on. That's why we do have that flood warning there for the central counties in Wisconsin. Uh, but that flood warning is going to expire later this evening and hopefully we can continue a drying trend uh, for most of the area. Let's think positive. Nice yes. for the next two days. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Nice, mostly sunny. And, oh, and, uh, we're doing this. Enjoy. It's my zen <laughs> moment. <laughs> All right, Dana, thank Thanks, you. Dana. There's still more to come at four. Does it seem like you're paying more for at the pumps? Well, that's because you are. We'll find out why and when we can expect gas prices to come down. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
Here's a live sunny look at downtown Madison on this Wednesday, clear enough for a couple of days here. Gas prices climbed to a four-year high this summer. But after Americans return from Labor Day weekend road trips, pulling up to the pump may be a little less painful on the wallet. Meg Oliver explains why. It's been an expensive summer for drivers. I've been spending more money on gas than I normally would. Olin Hugo is also feeling the pinch. He uses his car to make deliveries for work. It definitely impacts my budget. Um, I definitely have to, you know, spend less, um, save up for some gas. A gallon of gas is up 47 cents on average compared to this time last year. There have been a lot of factors that are making gas prices higher this year. A few of those include supply and demand. Tons of global demand, but not enough supply to keep up with that demand, in addition to volatile crude oil prices. But Jeanette Casolano from AAA says relief is on the way. The good news for consumers is gas prices are going to be cheaper this fall. Typically in fall, we do see gas prices drop, and that's because we see demand going down. People are done taking their summer road trips. Also, refineries are able to switch to a winter blend in September, which is cheaper to produce. In a new report, AAA predicts those factors will help push prices down about 13 cents a gallon in the coming weeks. Looking forward to it. Uh, saves me a lot because I travel a lot. That would be great. They need to drop. An economic crisis in oil producing Venezuela and sanctions on Iran could hurt future supply and trigger a jump in prices. But right now, experts believe driving is about to get cheaper. Meg Oliver, CBS News, New York. So have some patience. Coming up, he was Wisconsin's longest serving governor. There is a new book chronicling the life of Tommy Thompson. We'll hear from Doug Moe, who co-wrote the book with Thompson, when Live at Four continues.
certainly is lovely outside and uh, traffic's not looking too bad either right now. Throughout Dane County, most of our, our focus still um, downtown. A lot of road closures out there and also 14 heading westbound. A little closed right now. Now, as we look closer to the Beltline, both the east and westbound moving a little slowly, but they are crawling along right now. Eastbound at about 29 miles per hour, westbound uh, a little closer to 34 miles per hour. Again, over at 14, westbound still closed. Eastbound delayed a little bit as you get closer to Middleton, moving at about 11 miles per hour, but the rest of the stretch eastbound uh, still moving along right now. Again, downtown, a lot of road closures, but throughout Dane County, no major accidents to report at this time. We'll just keep a close eye on things. Let's look at your first alert traffic. All right, Dana, thank you. America's most iconic cookie is launching some spicy new flavors. Oreo is introducing wasabi and hot chicken wing Oreos. I don't know about that one. <laughs> you, don't worry, you're not going to find the flavors on the shelves here anytime soon. They're only available in China, but both flavors are available on eBay. It's I like what they did with the chips. You know, yeah. they're all different flavors I of chips. I can't even imagine wasabi Oreo. That I think might be okay. It's the chicken wing one where I don't, I don't know about that. Well, the many facets of Tommy G. Thompson, a small town grocer's son who became the longest serving governor in Wisconsin, are revealed in a new book. With co-author Doug Moe, Tommy Thompson traces his journey from his boyhood in Elroy to politics on the world stage to his service as a cabinet secretary under President George W. Bush. The book is called Tommy, My Journey of a Lifetime. And Doug is here in the studio with us today. Good to see you. Welcome Congratulations. Back. Thanks very much. What an amazing journey and what a project. How did you approach this? Well, first of all, it was a privilege because um, I'm a storyteller and if you want the great Wisconsin story, or at least one of them certainly of the last 50 years or so, it's, it's this kid from Elroy, <laughs> you know, as you say, getting to the world stage. So, um, yeah, as I say, honored to do it. We sat and, uh, and did 30 plus hours of interviews, uh, me uh, asking him about his life. I did other interviews with people and then would come back and kind of prompt him. That they'd tell a story he hadn't recalled and I would get you know, his, his version of it. I saw Jim Clauser three times. Wow. Um, but the book's written in his voice, um, so it's an autobiography. But in this enlightened age now, the, the co-author does get a co-author credit, so... Uh, did, did anything surprise you that you didn't know? Oh, about? yeah. Um, if, the complexity of his re relationship with his dad, um, that really, I think, launched everything for him. But for a long time, he, he didn't like his dad very much. He was one of these real tough, demanding guys. And, um, but in the end, I think Tommy realizes that he was doing it for his own good sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the very sad things is his dad died before he was elected governor. Um, another thing, how loyal his friends are, I did, and, and former colleagues. Um, I did a number of interviews, background interviews, with people who had worked for him 30, 35 years ago, and their memories were still very vivid and almost always very warm. Um, it was nice to see. You don't get elected four times as governor without, right. without having friends. Right, or ha and having that kind of infectious uh, You were on, for the record, with Governor Thompson this morning, yes. and he told this, this interesting story. Let's listen in. When I first ran, I went in, and I'll never forget this, I walked into this guy that was running the automobile dealership in Montella, Wisconsin, and he said, yeah, you, you look like a nice young man, and we need some new blood. And he said, I will support you. I walked out, and he came back out after me, and he says, I'm not going to support you anymore. And I hear him, 23 years old, running for my first office, and he tells me he's not going to support me. And I said, why? He says, because I thought you were smart, and I don't think you're that smart anymore. And I said, why? He said, because you shook my hand, but I got 45 people working here as mechanics uh -huh. and people in the office, and you didn't go by and ask them for your for their vote. Uh -huh. And I'll never, <laughs> ever do that again. That experience, George H.W. Bush, always remember where you come from, always go back and say hello and thank you to the people that prepare the meals, deliver the meals, work on your car. That is a lesson of life that I'll never forget. That, that is vintage really is. Tommy that Thompson. It totally is, yeah. He still shakes a lot of hands to this day, too. And I think another reason he was so popular, he was willing to work across the aisle. Right, and, and of course there's a lot of that in the book. He uh, had Tim Cullen as his first uh, health 
secretary, a Democrat. Um, later, Steve Bablich uh, became corrections secretary. Um, it's a kind of a cliche, but it's, it's cliches become those for a reason, mm -hmm. right? It, uh, it, you just don't see it anymore. Yeah, what a and, contrast with the politics right. of today. Um, and, uh, you know, Neil, for the show that's going to air Sunday, asked about John McCain. And, and there's a lot of, I think, some similarities there between oh, yeah. Tommy and McCain. You know? what, what was the, what led him into politics? Where did he come up with the idea to run for office? His dad was the, the uh, Bridges and Roads uh, guy on the board of Juneau County. And so he ran a grocery store in Elroy. And Friday nights, he would invite all his buddies in for uh, sausage and cheese and cards, whatever. But they would begin to kind of horse trade about what's happening out in the county with, we need a bridge here, that sort of thing. And Tommy was there sweeping up, listening to it, loved the talk of the deal making, and uh, said, you know, his sister told me, Julianne said, when he was 15, he said, I'm going to be governor someday. Wow. So, wow. Is politics out of his blood? Um, I don't think he'll run again, certainly. Yeah. Um, but he's still, uh, you know, in demand uh, to, to speak and to go help raise money and that sort of thing. And uh, he lost I, the Senate race to Tammy. He Ball. did, and that was devastating. It, you know, we first talked about doing this book in 2011. Um, he then ran for office, and I think he he uh, it really hurt, obviously, to lose that. And so we didn't really kick it up again until a couple years later. Um, so he'll, yeah, it's in his blood. Yeah, it's just, he's still got his finger on things. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, uh, you know, whether he, again, I, I want to, I don't think he'll run again. <laughs> but but he, I think he'd like, kind of like to. I think his kids would uh, lock him in the house and throw away the key <laughs> if he tried to. You think for everything, for the amazing life and career that he's had, that really at heart he still is this farm boy from Elroy? Yeah, well, the one to, you know, uh, when you finish a book and you're, you're thinking about certain things like the acknowledgments, and, and one morning at the kitchen table, I said, who are, we gonna, who, who are you going to dedicate this to? And he didn't, he didn't bat an eye. He said, to the people of Wisconsin. Aww. And uh, that's fitting, and, and that's what we did. You know, I just, just his name, Tommy. <laughs> he ran on the center of the Tommy. You know, the, uh, the, uh, his opponents, when he first ran in 66 for the assembly, 1966, um, they went to the uh, election commission, if there was one at the time, whatever the body was, and tried to get him thrown off the ballot because he was using a nickname, uh, uh -huh. you know, mm -hmm. on, on the ballot. Well, that's not a nickname. That's his name. That's his yeah, yeah. Oh, it is? Uh, yes. That's his given name. Yeah. No. I, another thing you <laughs> <we> would know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can see much more of the conversation with Doug and Tommy Thompson. On the record, for the record, this Saturday morning at 10.30 right here on Channel 3, right after Face the Nation. And you have a book signing coming up, but I understand it's sold out. It is. You can get on at wispolitics.com. You can get on a waiting list. It's at the Avenue Club uh, in September 13th. Is so the book available? The, yeah, the book's available now at Mystery to Me on Monroe Street. And we'll have another event October 13th at the library as part of a book festival. So oh, that one is, is not sold out. That's another reflection of, of his popularity. The book signing already sold out. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thanks, you guys. Great to see you. Yeah, it's right. fun to see you. Can't wait for the next book. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. We'll be right back with the final check of your forecast.
Phew, is what I said this morning. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, can breathe again. We can breathe again. The humidity is gone. The rain not in the forecast for the rest of the evening, guys. Here's a live look for us right now. Uh, really a, a beautiful shot. I'm picking up a little little rainbow, a little color there. Mm -hmm. The little camera lens, it looks like. A few clouds in the sky, but again, no rain as we head into this evening. Uh, this is a look at the last three hours. I promise it's not a still image. Our radar has <laughs> been nice and quiet, and that's a good thing for us. We stay calm overnight. Thursday, also expecting a really pleasant day for us. Just a little warmer. Our afternoon highs today landed close to 69 in Madison. Tomorrow will be in the low 70s. And then we warm up a little bit as we move into Labor Day weekend. The downside with that warm up, it comes along with with quite a bit of rain. Our shower and storm chance is going to increase Friday night into Saturday morning and then linger with us through almost all of next week. We're back to warm and muggy and uh, with the chance of showers and thunderstorms almost every day, Monday through Friday. For the first full week of September, somehow we've gotten to <laughs> September. <laughs> and the first full week of school for most yes, kids. Yes, that's right. Yes, so we're, uh, as you've mentioned, uh, you head back to school, it's got to warm up, right? Absolutely. That's the way things line no up. No air conditioning in school, it's got to get warm. It's got to get warm. But yes, today's been wonderful. I hope you're able to get outside this evening. And then tomorrow also looks really pleasant for us. A little bit of a drying trend for the next few days before the rain just flows right back in. Okay. All yes. right, Dana, thank you. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow here on Live Before, we'll find out what's happening in the 608 this weekend with Emmy Fink. And Madison author John Roach will be here. We'll talk about his chance encounter with Aretha Franklin, the Queen of Soul. That's coming up tomorrow on Live Before.